It is really my great pleasure this morning to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for today. Uh, yesterday when I was in a conversation with Michelle, she said, I actually don't teach. I create the conditions for learning to happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I could not have said it better. Uh, so um, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Michelle. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. Good morning, beautiful people. OK, look, I'm a middle school teacher. We're going to have to do better than that. Uh, this is how you know like when uh, you're back in school, when people stop making eye contact. I'm like, good morning. People are like, OK, so just, just like, I'm invisible. So good morning, beautiful people. All right. Uh, I am so honored and uh, terrified to be here. Uh, and so I thought perhaps I could just build my talk about liberation uh, called Dreaming Me Free. And um, I often thought, like, could I just deliver a talk based on hairstyles? You know what I mean? Like, this is a classic uh, early 70s look. Uh, <laughs> Should I point this way? All right. Uh, so when I want to offer what brought me to this moment. Uh, so my name is Michelle King. Uh, I don't know how long ago, eight or 10 years ago, I started uh, calling myself the learning instigator. And uh, just as a name of calling names of like, what do I actually do? And I feel like it's my superpower. And I feel like we all have superpowers. And the reason I ask that question, like, what is your superpower? Because I hate the question, what do you do? Because then it begins this weird hierarchical middle school dance, like, I mean, you know what I mean? And you're like trying to quantify your whole experience in a series of actions when you are a being, just a being being. And so how could you do that? And then what I also realize when you also just tell people your title, they just, like once I name you, I classify and then I'm gone. But you know, what would it do to kind of interrupt the ways that we are and just kind of like um, ask someone to slow down so they could hear your story? So, um, and the reason I chose Learning Instigator, and I tell this people all the time, is because one of the sexiest names in education was already taken, uh, and that was uh, Beyonce. And, uh, right? And because I, I feel like if you have like the one name, the single name, it's like, wow, it's a powerful name, right? Shakira, <laughs> Beyonce. Uh, unless there's two names, and that, that would be Shaka Khan. Right? You know, that's like, that's like a beautiful thing. Imagine if you're a middle school teacher. Good morning, Miss uh, Shaka Khan. Right? <laughs> and so, like, here's the thing. Like, we all have an inner diva. How many of you have an inner diva? I, like, some of you were like, voting twice. Yes. Right? Because here's the thing. Even Beyonce has an inner diva. What is it? Hello. Right? So here I am. I come by the way of Pittsburgh. I'm representing the 412. You know, like Pittsburgh love. And this is an important thing because it has shaped who I have become as a, a woman, a mother, a teacher in this space that I often say to outsiders, you need about, it's about two degrees of separation. Um, really, it's about 0.5 degrees of separation. And it's a city that reminds you to be kind because you are going to run into people. We should probably rename it. Karmaberg, because you will see your work come back to you. And so I'm very honored to be here because I'm representing a love that was given to me by this community, but also by the community here, Connected Learning. So this idea that, oh my gosh, like DML is here and Games Learning for Society, that has helped influence and crafted me as a teacher. And I was like, oh my gosh. Drew Davidson sends me an email. It's like, hey, Michelle, do you want to do this? I happened to be in Ethiopia at the time. Didn't respond, said this again. And I was like, OK, sweet. I'll do this. I didn't exactly know what that meant when I saw the keynote speakers, because I was like, uh, and so of course, when anybody, uh, like a friend, asks you to do something, you go, like, how do I start preparing for this talk? Uh, just. And what's beautiful about this, like when you, by, by the way, that was yesterday's Google uh, <laughs> image. 
And what's really interesting is like, you just have to get to how to fake. It's not artwork, it's not, you know, identity, it's like death. That clearly is like, <laughs> how many of you people are like, oh my God, go to work to how to fake death, right? So, um, but I really wanted to honor the relationship here with people. And what's, I've always appreciated humor in that what it offered was like this space in between what we expect and don't expect. But I also think about space because when I was a little kid, I used to have terrible nightmares about space. Because I feel, I don't know how many of you have ever had that where you're panning out, panning, before Google Earth, panning out, panning out into nothingness. Did you all? This is, this is not when you like share in a community and you're like, oh, I. I <laughs> People were like, oh, I don't, I don't identify. Because people were like, I was there just at the atmosphere. Uh, but so I used to be terrified by this kind of notion of space. Uh, but I feel like I've come to embrace it. And it's in this space. I learned about this graphic years ago in Pittsburgh. And I was like, wow. I always thought like school was central in importance. But look at all that blue space. And I felt such pressure as a teacher to try to do everything that I needed to do because I was thinking I, had a, I was the blue space. But I was like, oh, actually, uh, <laughs> there's so much that can be done. And so when I saw the ideas and work of Connected Learning and the communities that supported this and Mimi Ito's work, I was like, oh, wow, actually, this, this is about abundance. And I have been living my life as if I were governed by scarcity. There's not enough. But in fact, how do we activate the best parts of us, communities, resources, wisdom, that in fact we can create a much richer environment? But I want to start with what not just bring, brought me here, but because I'm a history teacher, I want to start with some lessons. It's going to be a while. So we're going to start at the history of the year. <laughs> we're like, <laughs> you know, like at the moment, we're like, this is why I hate history. Um, but I think it's important to kind of think about in this way, because where do we begin to tell the story of the world? And I know we're very kind of human-centered, but we're probably about a minute to midnight in the whole story. But I think about what it reminds us of is that we're part of a larger lineage, a larger lineage of humans that have come before us and after us. And how many of you have ever um, experienced the night sky with no ambient light? Like you just get to see the stars. Like just see the hands again? Because there's a kind of a little sadness if you haven't seen it, right? And in that moment, you realize you're both inconsequential and all powerful and that you're part of billions of people before you and after you who looked at the sky in the same way. And that it reminded me like, oh wow, my little life is beautiful. And I'm part of billions of people that are gonna do beautiful things. And it takes the pressure off like what I'm going to do, right? So I also wanna ground us in this space it's often interesting where we decide to tell the story of place and space. And so where do we begin to tell the story of Cambridge? But perhaps we start with the native peoples that came here before us. And I really love this map, the Tribal Nations map, because it's a, a, a map of the language of the native peoples that were here, not those of us who colonized that gave us names, but the names. And names are important, right? Names signal us a way of belonging, it signals us a history. And so to honor the native peoples that were here before, because um, to remind us, we're all historical actors building things that will not last. And I feel like that's a place of liberation, right? That it's like, hmm, I'm going to build this thing, and it may not be here. But I just have to worry about it in this moment, right? How many of you feel like that's a place of like, okay, wow, I can relax into that? All right, the 10 of us will get together later. <laughs> but I think about all the things that have been created and are no longer here in like just the last 10 years. 
Like, I was building my jam on MySpace. Eric, <laughs> right? Some of my favorite music was on the 8-track. <laughs> you know, it's like, here are my 10 favorite songs I'd like to share with you. <laughs> um, this uh, place that we're sitting at now, uh, up until 1638, was known as Newtown. And I always love that, you know, when places are created, they're like giving the new, like New York and New Jersey and the new, and I'm curious about what this space will be. But it has been the home to many peoples of all ethnicities, of all kind of aspirations. And now we sit on this spot of multiple communities now creating and trying to create something new and more beautiful. So when, uh, since we're talking about time, come to a very pivotal year, 1968. Any 1968 folks here, born in 68? Some of you are like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like, you might have recently had a birthday and told someone you were like 36, and they're like sitting next to you, you're like, oh, I'm not 68. No, I'm not. Uh, right? 68 was the year that I was born, and many amazing things happening in 68. Uh, but it was the time that I was imagined in the future. I'm from an Ethiopian woman in Adigrat, who on some level you could look and say, was illiterate. And yet, how does a futurist read the environment, read what's coming up, to imagine me? And this right here, like how would she know? And my father is African American. And what's really interesting about being seated in that identity and, and being a child of an immigrant and being an army brat where I traveled all over the world, I was raised as an American. That's challenging when you come to America, because you have all these other identities. And I remember when I first, I went to high school in, uh, this, uh, I'm old, I went to high school in West Germany uh, <laughs> during the Cold War, and I came to UCLA, and I remember somebody said, oh, you're African American. I was like, holy shit, how'd you know my mom is African and my dad's American? They're like, that's, uh, it's not exact, you know, like, I, you know, I, like, missed several labels of things, um, just moments. Because back in the day, it took, like, like, a year or two before things came out, so I missed, like, whole cultural movements, right? But this is very important and central to my identity. Um, and so when I think about the space that has happened between 1968 and 2018, I think about my age. And it's funny, it's like only in the first two years is it socially acceptable to talk about yourself in months. But I was like, I'm going to bring that back. <laughs> 601 months, uh, yes. <laughs> um, technically, I'm 50 years in and 1.6 months. And I like this idea of like thinking about time. And so Wait By Why, Wait By Why is like a really awesome blog and showed this whole graph about like one's life by weeks and like uh, 90 years by weeks. And I said, oh, cool. And I was like, oh, what if I put my life in that? And I was like, yeah, nailed it, right? The first 21 years, got that all set up. And then um, I started like looking at the graph and I was like, and there is where 50 is. And that's great. And then you start looking like, ooh, that's pretty far down the charts. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then you start like really looking at that chart, you go like, ooh, this would be a good time to think about time management. Uh, <laughs> I feel like it's a little bit like when you play the game Civ and you don't like look at the manual and you're deep in it and you're like, ooh, this would be a good time to study the manual. Um, and I feel like I never, it's like now time kind of moves differently. So I now have a sense of exigency this is a word that a friend of mine, Jamila Rice, told me about. An exigency is that kind of visceral urgency. Because if I only have this short amount of time left, and it's not like I'm guaranteed this kind of last 30 or so years, um, how do I hold my life? And how am I responsible for this life, this life? And so I think about, start thinking about the future um, and the state of things. And so it has 
come to me to think about this idea of transgressing to the beloved community. Because uh, with the time that I have left, what is the real aspiration that I want to help bring forward? Because when you ask people, what is the future like? It's terrifying, right? Like one of the things that we can imagine is like, <laughs> literally, you ask people like, what's the future gonna be like? Zombie apocalypse, Hunger Games, Westworld. You know, if you were like, what does the world like, look like if there's love? And it's just like, blink, blink, blink. Because we can, it's like we, we're almost geared towards the negative, right? So we have this aspiration, but we have this fear. And what's fascinating about thinking about the future as scary is that we know more about humans than any other time in human history, every single day. We, yes, no, yes. right? I know what people eat. I know what they dress. I know what they think about, like all kinds of things, more things than I wanted to know. And yet we're scared of each other. And so how is that? Um, there's also something, uh, as I was looking up, I was looking at the doomsday clock. Anybody know what the doomsday clock is? Yeah, I feel like more of us should know this, <laughs> like what this means, right? <laughs> We're like, oh, I don't know. Um, so it's kind of like this clock that was created in 47 that was a marker of like, you know, the destruction caused by humans. And it was seven minutes to midnight in 68. And so in the 50 years, I think like we have made progress in getting closer to midnight. How? Right? That's of today. And so what is our responsibility as humans, as part of a larger lineage, to bring forth a beloved community? Um, and when I think about uh, being scared or uncertain, I think it's important to go to like the holy texts um, to get a sense of grounding. Um, and so I'd like to go to <laughs> Monsters, Inc., spiritual text that actually teaches a lot about life. How many of you have seen? Hello, right? I feel like that just returned to us what it's like. So that city, Monstropolis, is powered by fear, right? And the monsters have to come through the door and scare children, right? Ah, right, and that's how they get the electricity. And of course, they have to keep scaring. You have to elevate the scaring in order to power the city. And I love it when Sully comes up and like bumps his head and cracks the girl up. And all of a sudden it's like <laughs> So how do we stop scaring each other? And how do we tap into things that are actually ever present? They're not conditional. Like I love the word joy as opposed to happiness. I feel like happiness is conditional. I want to get that next, when that happens, right? But joy feels like this like, river that's ever present that you can still experience if there's sadness, if there's anger, it's something just to tap into. And so how do we move from this state of constantly being in fear to joy? And for me, it is to come to this idea of the beloved community. Martin Luther King said, um, in the end, but the end is reconciliation, the end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is a type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. It is this type of understanding, good real will, that will transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men. Love is a verb. It is actionable. It's not kind of, I don't believe, a kind of emotional state. It is what we habitually do. And so as I think about my life, um, I love, you know how it's like you tell the story of your life, like, I was marching and I did things and I hit progress. Like, this is actually how your life is. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I want to think, like when I, people ask me, like, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm a hot mess. And I feel like that's a place of liberation, just to be like, I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm human just like you. Um, and what I, I want to ground us in this notion of what helps gives me solace, and that's that any of the work that we do is rooted in listening. And I feel like how many of us are like, 
Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you listening? How many of us ask for that daily? All right. What does it mean to listen? <laughs> He's like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Money. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, listening. Uh, in the tradition I study, there are four levels of listening. At the root level is one that we probably can all identify as the Charlie Brown teacher listening. Wah, 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 wah. Right? How many of you listen at, like, at that level, where it's like, I'm just waiting for that person to take a breath, and I'm in, right? You know, it's like, they could be telling you the meaning of life, whatever, nothing. Uh, the level above that is where I feel like we are politically and socially in this country, is that I listen whether you're for or against me. Right? That's when, as soon as you say, uh, you say your political party, I, I know where you stand. As soon as, like, what neighbor, uh, I know. Right? Uh, and I feel like it's this interesting developmental age where it's almost like the toddler stage. I like, I don't like, I like, I don't like. When you keep sorting the world in that way, there's very little to kind of come to this, to any sense of like, um, to even recognize that we're very complex. How many of you are filled with hypocrisies? Oh, <laughs> people are like, I was waiting for that question. <laughs> right. um, so that level above that um, is to listen empathically. Uh, and how many of you have been afforded when someone has just granted you their attention just to hear your story? And that's a different way of being. How many of you have afforded someone that kind of listening? Beautiful. Also good, we have some practitioners. Uh, the last level of listening, because I thought, like, if you could listen empathically, that's amazing, and we should shoot for that. But there's actually a level above that, and that is to listen people into their own wisdom. And there's a way of kind of holding space in which, you know what, you don't have to solve the problems. A lot of times we actually know, and good questions open up space. Like, sometimes I actually feel like we should um, learn to not do. Does that make sense? Right? To just ask questions, to be curious, and have a person come to their own wisdom. And so that actually is talked about even in here. There's uh, Theory U, and they talk about uh, listening and how listening can be really, in its wisest state, a practice that is generative. I often feel like, you know, we could get rid of everything and just use our lives as our text. Each of us has a curriculum and understanding about the world. And can we listen in a way to understand each other? So I really love this chart because I feel like, uh, like the way we like, oh, I get listening. And we're like very confident and no practice, right? We're confident because we can talk about it or we can say it, but when it actually comes into practice, can we listen empathically? Can we listen people into their own wisdom? Well, let's, let's practice together. So, oh, no, we're, we're, all, we're still? Yes, everybody still with me? Yes, right. We are a community of practitioners. So we're gonna offer another human being near you, next to you, um, what it's like to listen. And the goal really is to try to listen at levels three, those top, you know, listen empathically or listen people into their own wisdom. All right, so let's stand up. Some of you are like, I'm unfamiliar with this human screen. <laughs> <laughs> and turn to a person so we know everybody has uh, someone to talk to. We have an odd person now. All right. Here is your first question. What brings you joy? One listener, one speaker.
Beautiful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another time to practice. Because like, here's the thing, what I would say is we're, we're bringing these conversations in and feelings into any space that we occupy, right? Yes? No? Right. And I'll say, you know, sometimes that joy doesn't get activated because, um, and I just want you to turn to a person next to you in the same way, hold about a minute for that person or so, and talk about this question. What brings you? <laughs> oh wait, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back. Like, <laughs> people are like joy, 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 joy. Monster Z, right? It's we already like you feel the shift in the energy once you just ah. Oh, here we go, right? But let's let's hold that, right? Because that's what we're bringing into any space, right? Same thing. Offer the person near you, around you. If you need a partner, I'm up here too. Sitting next to you, yes, beautiful. Talk to someone new. Because even if you don't know that person, we often can be signaling to each other our fears. And I would like to hold more spaces of grace and not activate your fear, right? Let's how we release it. So let's practice again. Next to you, begin. <laughs> You can stop being afraid. <laughs> all right, all right. We don't have to continue to scare each other. Nice. Beautiful people testing, testing, testing. The beatings will continue until morale improves. Um, so, fear. That's interesting because it's like, it's like we just kept going. <laughs> it's like we were just like, ugh, 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 right? <laughs> and that's what we do to each other all the time, right? Um, and I would like to ask you, what are you giving your attention to? Do we keep scaring ourselves, or do we keep kind of creating opportunities for joy. It's something to notice. It's not to sit in a place of judgment. I recognize I spent a lot of time terrorizing myself, and then to what end, right? And then I used it on others. Because <laughs> that was what I was practicing. And I would offer that it's all a practice. We are what we habitually do. So I've been really intrigued by this question. This I want to say a little bit about because um, that answer, the answer to this question has changed over time. But I'm intrigued. Like, what do we need to learn as humans right now? So I, I've always loved learning. And uh, there was a shout out to librarians yesterday. I want to give that shout out again, right? And to teachers. That, that was, those were the OG recommendation engines. They'd be like, oh, you need to check this out. Ah, you need to check this out, right? And teachers, right? Like, this is like beautiful work to be seen. So I want to talk about there's um, a kind of spiritual practice of sitting at the charnel grounds. The charnel grounds are like on the outside of society where they go and dump the dead bodies and the debris and trash. And there's this idea if you can sit amongst all of that decay and detritus and death, that you can become enlightened, awoken, awakened, right? And so I decided to try that practice. And I, I decided to teach <laughs> middle school, right? Come on. Yes, yes. Come on. You were like, I will live amongst the self-righteous and wrong, and, <laughs> and they see no hypocrisy in their ways, right? These are people who complain. They're like, it's too cold. You're like, it's ice cream. Uh, you know? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? 
They're like, I'm just, I'm just designed to hate and destroy things. You're like, okay, good. Um, but that's like a very generous, like uh, teaching middle school taught me how to love other beings. Right? Because I'm surprised, you know, this is a moment where you're like, why don't more mothers eat their young? Right? <laughs> And how many of you can remember middle school? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How many of you deleted it? Like, I this big blank between, you know, yeah. fifth or sixth grade and high school. I just went pro. I just kept going, right? Uh, and so this has been a very uh, interesting place of wisdom, I feel like. A lot of times we are stuck emotionally in middle school, right? It's like, but I'm like an adult in an adult body and I can drive. But you know, like something can be said and you're like, regressed, right? Back to this point. Um, that is a place where uh, I decided to become a history teacher. I originally was going to be like a Cold War warrior, and then the Cold War ended, so then you gotta like go to a backup plan. Um, and this uh, top graph is just for teachers. <laughs> uh, you're, gonna be like, you're like, I'm gonna part wisdom on the learned, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> This is, you know, like when the laugh lingers, you're like, I know my tribe. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's a little shout out for us, <laughs> right? Um, and I used to think that teaching was just about this kind of imparting of knowledge, and I just gotta give you this information and dates and names and all of those things. But in fact, um, what I realized after years of teaching is my work is actually building society and wishing that kind of society into the future more than it is about kind of imparting any huge amounts of information so that you know and then you will do. Then in fact, it's in the practice of being in community that we become our country, become a place of equity and social justice and love and compassion. It's not in the books, it's some work in between us. So um, I'll, I'll go back because like, where do you think I had to go? Um, I went to the most dangerous place in Pittsburgh, one of the most dangerous places, to hone my craft. Oh, that was the suburbs. And uh, <laughs> I know, you're like, because I needed to save white up the middle class children. Um, see, it's, it's interesting when you say, like, you put in another group, right? But there's actually, I would tell people, there's suffering in the suburbs. People are like, oh, I don't think so. Well, there's suffering everywhere, right? And the pressure to be. Um, and I also became clear that my work was not about saving people. Because each of us has wisdom, right? Like kids, their lives are an understanding of what it's like to be human in their experience. And how do you activate that? Um, and I taught in the suburbs for a long time, 16 years. Um, but you ever felt like I'm called to do something else, I have a sense of this urgency. And I actually stopped believing in this idea that all right, work really hard, go to this high school, get this job, get this house, be happy, right? When I saw that there was this suffering that was there, and I thought, like, this is a place that people said to aspire to, and yet there is a deep sadness even in this place, even though there are material wealth. So I decided to go to the charter school in my area. You know, the charter schools were the ideas of teachers, and I thought, like, how can you um, and they were meant to be the progressive end of public education. And I went there with my school husband. Um, <laughs> so uh, Nick Kaczmarek, that's, if I'm Beyonce, then you are. Uh, I try to be David. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> How could you give a brother a better setup? And then he's like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Babe, you're usually like, what, what? <laughs> right, beautiful. Uh, we are. <laughs> I was like, do you want to be my new Jay-Z? Who was the one who set me on the line? Look, oh, right there, right there, right there. Sorry, babe, you've been fired. Um, so uh, I call him Kaz affectionately. We are both a uh, writing project, part of the National Writing Project. Um, and that's a lot of writing project love here in this space. And we came together to go to this charter school and build um, the aspirations of, of community a robust and healthy and beloved community. Um, and in that journey, uh, I think, you know, we've had several existential discussions, and I mean like daily, 
about our work. And I don't know, as teachers and creators, how many of you are like, am, am I doing the right work? Is this the thing I'm doing? Is this the thing I'm serving? Is this enough in this space? Do we need to do this work elsewhere? And so we began to look at the spaces in between uh, in the lives of children be when they're at home in school, and that's a big space, right? And that space is important because there's a lot of meaning and wisdom in those spaces. We began to tackle this um, idea of when kids were at the table of their own learning. Welcome, respected, connected, seen. And when kids were not at the table of their own learning, marginalized, disempowered, silenced, restricted, disconnected. And constantly looked at our work back and forth and through each other. Are we doing the things that we said we do, that we want to do, in service of this larger notion of building this robust, beautiful, beloved community? And that space in between is critical. It's not often looked at. But there's so much meaning that's coming into those spaces. Um, recently, we, we created this. There's a group of us in Pittsburgh. Um, and created this chart to kind of like look at our own data, right? And a couple people talked about data in the Ignite Talks yesterday that I deeply appreciated. Um, but how do we use our own lives? Like I think, like I'm 50, I'm like big data. <laughs> I mean, I, that's what I hear, right? Like how many of you think of yourselves as like big data? <laughs> Good, I'm like, I have like at least 12 solid friends in this crowd, like just like. <laughs> I mean, in terms of like answering all the weird questions and all this, no, right? But like, why don't we think of our own lived experience and ways of being as understanding how our systems work and how society works? And so thinking about this notion of, uh, and we're not gonna do this, so I wanna talk about sometimes, but we have people plot this chart. And what's interesting is that it's not the same. I don't care what your ethnic background, orientation, class, all of those things, gender. There are times when we're not at the table of our own learning. How many of you have experienced times when you've been at the table of your own learning, when you've been seen, right? Connected, respected. How many of you have not been at the table of your own learning at any point in your career, right? So it's in the same, it's all of us, right? And so how do we think about building spaces in which people can be at the table of their own learning? Um, another question we ask and we plot on our graph is, when did you first become aware of race? So let's just do a quick survey. This is a great uh, piece by Beverly Tatum. Um, it's a book of why, did all the, why do all the black children sit in the cafeteria together? So let's just, as a community, uh, when did you, uh, raise your hand, so just pre-K to kindergarten. So it's awareness of race in school. Uh, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, university. Right now. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> Do you ever have those moments where it's like, oh, this might be an intervention? <laughs> I think I, I, shit, I'm black. <laughs> just like, right? <laughs> so if you just, I want to just see elementary school, if any like pre-K to elementary, just in that moment, right? So what's really fascinating about this is this idea that we notice it, and then, but then we can't talk about it, or we, um, hide it or, you know, how many, how many of you have an experience in which you noticed race as a kid, um, but then somebody, an elder, adult, somebody was like, eh, don't say that. And they were like, here, I have shame. <laughs> just, just take that, right? Or we're like, we can't. But it's, the thing, it's not the noticing of difference. It's the value it, that you attach to that difference, right? There are times when I noticed race as a kid when I lived in Germany, in West Germany, and, um, Oh, in this moment, I, it wasn't that I recognized race. I, I lived in a place where like, there were Germans who had never seen like, a brown person. And so people would come up to me as an adult when I was three and like, rub my skin and then taste. And I would be like, oh my, 
I think I'm chocolate. She's like, <laughs> like imagine that cotton candy afro. I was just like a sugary delight for, right? And then as I was older, uh, you know, my, I told you my mom was an immigrant and this is in the 70s in the Black is Beautiful movement. And uh, I would see my dad say to other African-American soldiers like, what's up, soul brother? Right? And, you know, as a kid, you just recognize patterns. And so uh, I then said to every black man, what's up, soul brother? And my mother would be like, shut up, shut up, you know, but, right? And so there are times when we notice those things about race, but they don't necessarily have this kind of negative connotation, but we notice it. <laughs> I know, how many of you have that parent that's just like, oh God, you're bringing shame upon the family, but it didn't stop me. There'd just be heel marks dragging, like, so brothers! <laughs> so we can have opportunities and hold space to talk about serious things and challenging things like race. And when we notice that we're little, but we don't have, we don't even talk about it as adult, where are the opportunities to practice? Again, it's a practice. And if we're bringing in fear, if we're bringing in shame, doubt, doubt that I could work with doubt, well, then we don't ever get to practice. And we can hold grace and forgiveness in ourselves in ways because we recognize that we're just practicing. Another question we asked was, when did you become aware of injustices? How many of you recognize injustice in the learning spaces that, I mean, you can, I'm even talking homeschooled, because you're like, oh, my mom's wrong. Uh, <laughs> but how many of you recognize injustice on some level? Right? How many of you have been the beneficiary of someone's generosity and love? Someone looked out for you. And I mean that within a school. That could be a coach, that could be um, the janitor, it could be the cafeteria, it could be your counselor, history teacher, anyone, right? These stories are all rich. And this is the beautiful big data that all of us occupy. And how do we hold the spaces so that we hear the complexity of these stories, right? That we just don't bypass because that person has a name or oh, this behavior. But what is the story of that person and the life that they have? Um, I'd like to give you an opportunity. Let me just double check on the time. Um, to think about this story. Um, and at some point during the conference with your friend, child, spouse, lover, anybody, Think about how you might share one of these stories. It will add to the kind of rich, complex fabric of who we are as a community. I want to give a little shout out to my boy, Ray McClear. Um, this, is, uh, this is how you know like a community is built on love. Like before I was like Michelle King and up here talking, someone wel welcomed and recognized me into a space. 2011, when I came to games, learning, and society, and I didn't know anybody. We actually knew, like, Drew Davidson, because I'd met him a couple months before, but I didn't really know him. You know how when people are new, and they have this title, and they're kind of terrifying? He's kind of, you know, Drew Davidson, he had, like, two Ds. It was, like, D squared. And I remember, like, I came into the space, and, I, and he said, are you stalking me? <laughs> I was like, how are you going to give a sister that entrance? You know what I mean? I was like, oh, no, gosh. Um, but that was all that. I know that's love. <laughs> now that I know him and like all the other stories, but totally out of love and welcome me. Um, and there was a pre-educators conference. And I remember Remy came and welcomed, just said hello. And there's, there's a huge amount of generosity and just being acknowledged into a space. And I have been served by his generosity in indivisible, invisible ways. So there's this uh, hypothesis. I don't know how many of you have used hypothesis. It's like a public way of annotating a document. Yes, love? Yeah, beautiful. And I saw the work that he and others were doing. Uh, Cantrell, where's your sister? I saw your work in, right, in the marginal syllabus. And I got to try that this summer with a good friend of mine, Melissa Butler. We did a Teachers as Thinkers uh, 
teaching for a week, which really was a love letter to teachers. But I'm really interested in the ways that we can create space so that we can learn in public. And how can we sit and wrestle with ideas, um, to be challenged by them, to talk to people, and to do that in many ways. That you might not recognize as a community that you're offering so many people like myself and others opportunities to be in community with you that directly and indirectly affects our teaching, our practice, our ways of being. I love uh, Baldwin. It's like really interesting when you read his work and you feel like he's talking about today. And that letter was from 50, that was like 55 years ago. And I think about education and the power of education and what it's meant to do. It's really meant to wake us up to build a more beautiful world that our hearts imagine. And so when I think about metaphors that are very powerful, I love this idea that love is a collaborative work of art. Like this conference that was brought together by multiple communities, multiple people that wish this into a future, that this is a space held as a collaborative work of art. So to go back to time and recognizing what I'm working with, um, at best, maybe I'm guaranteed about 30,000 days. I've like, as of today, burned through 18,310 and a half, 11. I go back to this notion of the beloved community and recognizing myself as part of the human lineage of thinkers and people like my mother who wish me into the future. And I think about this question that we can all hold as designers, game creators, teachers, librarians, just human beings. How might we create and hold spaces that activate generosity, wonder, joy, forgiveness, and abundance? And what might the world look like if we were to habitually practice this into the future? And it's purely on faith, right? And that maybe I think my work and our work is just cultivating the soil to plant the seed, to do the work. And I think about this notion of love, as Bell Hooks talked about it, and talks about it. That a way to kind of live our way into the future is how we are. And what will we leave the next generation? as our practices, as our ways of being. And there are black people in the future. <laughs> My mom said, right? And there are Latinx in the future, and there are queer folks in the future, and there are my Jewish brothers and sisters in the future, my Asian brothers and sisters and everybody in between, all of us, and all the many identities that we hold. Uh, liberation, my liberation and yours are tied together. And a beloved community for me is a path in which we see our liberation as tied to each other. I want to move away from this idea of, of liberation being or freedom being conditional or relational, right? I can be free without oppressing somebody else. So that clock is urgent, and it's ticking, and we have work to do. Um, and yet I don't have a sense of fear. I have faith and generosity. Because hope is actionable like love. Uh, this is my sugar bear. Uh, and she is a quarter Russian, a quarter Romanian, a quarter Ethiopian, and African American, Jewish and Buddhist roots, a product of America, and everything that is hopeful and beautiful about this space. That's me, her, and her father. We've been divorced for 16 years, and my aspiration is to raise a compassionate child. I should have picked something easier, like don't stab anybody. But. <laughs> Because right? then I was like, oh, you have to be compassionate. You just can't like, oh, be compassionate, child. <laughs> that, in fact, my work and working and being in 
collaboration and co-liberation and love is seen as, um, with her father, is lifelong work. And it's beautiful work. And she is a product of love. And I asked the world to hold her in the way that she was created. And not just her, but all children, all beings, to be loved. Brothers and sisters, beautiful people, this is our art. In the ways that we do it in particular, whether we're researchers or game designers or teachers or counselors or just human beings, which is pretty damn amazing. We can do this work, dreaming we free. Thank you.